Good morning. Uh, I hope you can see the slide. Yes? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, so we are talking about decision problems, right? And we saw one theorem which uh, gave a characterization uh, of uh, automata which accept, uh, 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 which are non-empty, that is, they accept some string, and also a characterization of the finiteness of the language accepted by the automaton, right? So we gave a characterization. So based on that, we can decide the emptiness of the language accepted by checking whether there is a string of length up to n, which is in the language, right? And to do that, we generate all strings up to length n and see if any one of them is accepted. And then the language, if so, then the language is non-empty, otherwise it is empty. I mean, this, is, this follows from the theorem we uh, showed last time. But this is an extremely inefficient algorithm, as, as you would uh, imagine. Instead, the emptiness of LM is just equivalent to checking whether uh, Any finite, any finite state is reachable. Right, so uh, what is the algorithm for that, anyone? How do we check whether a final a finite state is reachable? Which algorithm do we run? So any searching algorithm like DFS or BFS? Right. So you just run uh, BFS or DFS, and uh, whenever you reach, uh, um, explore a new node, check whether it is final or not. And at the end, if no final state has been reached, then the language is empty, right? And what is the complexity? Well, the complexity, as you know, is order of n plus n. So this is the number of vertices in the graph. That is the number of states, right? And uh, M is the number of edges, which is the number of transitions. Right? And this is uh, certainly order N square. Because the number of edges is upper bounded by N square, right? So. That's emptiness. Uh, to check whether LM is a finite set of strings, well, we can use the theorem uh, that we stated yesterday. Uh, check if any string of 
length between n and 2n minus 1 is an LM by generating all such strings and running the automaton. But then again, this is very inefficient. Instead, uh, what we can do is again, uh, uh, run BFS or DFS uh, as follows. Uh, so first, uh, run BFS, DFS, uh, uh, and delete all unreachable states because they play no role in language acceptance and also states from which we cannot reach a final state. Any idea how one one can do this? Any idea? You want to throw away states uh, from which uh, the final state, uh, uh, any final state is not reachable. How do we do it? We can start with all the final states for the BFS and only do the BFS till uh, the, we are uh, traveling the connected components. But, uh, right, we have to reverse the edges of the graph and start yes. the start the uh, BFS from uh, the final states. Right, take each final state, run a BFS backwards huh, on the reverse graph, and throw away everything that is not reached. Right. After, after running it from all the final states, right? So uh, it is certainly a polynomial time algorithm, uh, but you have to run BFS, DFS multiple times. So once you've done that, we can conclude that the resulting, sorry, uh, the original, the original automaton M accepts an infinite language if and only if the resulting transition diagram. It may not be a DFA because uh, some of the states might have been dropped in step one. Has uh, the initials 
state at least one final state well it, it, it uh, yeah And it has a cycle. This is the important thing. Uh, we want to check whether there is a path from an initial state uh, to a final state which uh, repeats a node. OK, and this is one way to do that. There are, there, are, there are other ways of doing it. OK. Right, so this is the algorithm for finiteness. Uh, we can also determine whether uh, to DFA are equivalent. But this is uh, easy to do because uh, if uh, L1 is LM1 and L2 is LM2, Two, then uh, L one is the same as L two if and only if uh, the symmetric difference between L1 and L2 is empty, and the symmetric difference is L1 difference L2 union L2 difference L1. So this is the symmetric difference, if and only if this is empty, right? And we know how to do intersection. We know how to do union. We have algorithms for that, right? Using DFA and epsilon, NFA and all that. We, we know how to do complement. And we know how to do checking for emptiness. So we can apply all the previous algorithms uh, to design this. Okay. So, yes, any questions about decision problems? So these are the uh, important uh, decision problems about uh, regular languages. And we assume that uh, we are provide the the language is specified by giving a DFA that accepts the language. Because remember, a language is in general an infinite object. It may be an infinite set. And however, regular languages, even though they may be infinite in general. They have a finite description because there is a DFA uh, which accepts such a language, right? So we assume that the input to the algorithm is a DFA. Uh, another possibility is uh, a regular expression, okay? So all that is possible, right? So what I have done here is only for DFA. Any questions?
Right. So now we come to one of the deepest uh, results for regular languages. Uh, this is known as the Weihill Nerode theorem. Right. And uh, one of the consequences of this theorem is how to minimize uh, a DFA, that is, how to obtain a DFA with a minimum number of states which accepts a given regular language. But that's just one consequence. Uh, this theorem has far reaching consequences. It gives a characterization of regular languages which is both necessary and sufficient, unlike. Uh, the pumping lemma. The pumping lemma gives a condition which is necessary. So it says if a language is regular, then something something is true, right? So that condition is necessary for a language to be regular. Okay, but it is not sufficient because there are languages which satisfy the pumping lemma but which are not regular. Okay, so the usefulness of the pumping lemma is to rule out that certain languages are not regular by showing that they do not satisfy this uh, necessary condition, right? But the myhill narrow theorem gives a characterization which is both necessary and sufficient. Unfortunately, it's not there in this uh, uh, Motwani book. It was there in the original uh, Hopcroft and Almond book. Um, you may not have access to that book, so what I can do is upload the relevant uh, pages. I'll, I'll do that later. Okay, but remember that this is not there in, in the Motwani book. Why? Because it was considered too difficult. Okay, but. Uh, in IIT, we are all tough guys here, so uh, we don't run away from difficult things. Rather, we welcome them. So uh, here we go. We are going to talk about the My Hill the Road here. These are two famous uh, logicians. who independently discovered this result in the 1950s. But before we come to the theorem, uh, we do a small recap of equivalence relations. So recall, that a relation, a binary relation on a set S, this is capital S, is uh, an equivalence relation if it is reflexive symmetric and transitive. Right. What does reflexive mean? It means that X R X, right? Symmetric means uh, X R Y implies Y R X, and transitive means X R Y and Y R Z implies X R Z and this is true for for all X Y Z belonging to S right so that's an equivalence relation given an equivalence relation we define the equivalence class of X
this is denoted by this uh, x within square bracket. So, so this is the set of all y uh, all elements y such that x are y. Y belonging to S, of course, it is understood, right? And what is the set of the set of equivalence classes? of R, or I should say S under the relation R. This is often uh, denoted by using this product, uh, sorry, the quotient, okay? So, This is just the set of equivalence classes for X. And often uh, we do, we use uh, notation we use these symbols for equivalence classes, uh, for equivalence uh, relations, right? And uh, so all this is known to you, I suppose. If these things are not known to you, stop me. Uh, so what are examples of equivalence relation? Well, uh, let me take uh, the the most uh, famous examples and from natural numbers, right? So congruence say congruence modulo n or say congruence modulo three for a for a concrete example. Right? So this is an equivalence relation of the natural numbers. So we say that uh, x is congruent to y mod 3, 3 divides, this is the definition, x minus y, right? So what are the equivalence classes? of this relation. How many equivalence classes and what are they? You were introduced to equivalence relations in discrete maths, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Right. So, so what are the uh, uh, equivalence classes of this equivalence relation? Zero, one, and two. Well, uh, yeah, those are rep zero, one, and two are the representatives. Right. So if you think about it, if this is the set of natural numbers, right, then there are three equivalence uh, classes, um, namely those Xs which are congruent to zero mod three. Here are those Xs which are congruent to one mod three. 
and those x's which are congruent to two mod three, right? So you can say this is the equivalence class of zero, namely all numbers divisible by three. This is the equivalence class of one, namely all numbers which leave the remainder one when divided by three. And similarly, this is the equivalence class of two. So zero, one, and two are representatives of these classes, right? But the classes themselves, are uh, depicted this way, right? Okay, so uh, here's a new definition uh, or a couple of new definitions. Uh, given an equivalence relation, Uh, where is that? Yeah. The index of this relation is the cardinality of its of its equivalence classes. I mean, so if the relation is on the set S, we are talking about the cardinality of the quotient set okay we're talking about the cardinal so for this uh what uh congruence modulo three the index is three for this particular equivalence relation one more definition okay so uh, given two, two equivalence relations, R1, and R2 on the same set, S, we say that R1 is a refinement of R2 if The following is true for all X, Y belonging to S, it is the case that if X is related to Y by R1, then this implies that X is related to Y via R2, okay? And this really means in terms of equivalence classes, right? Every equivalence class of R2 is a union of um, 
equivalence classes of R1. Okay. So look closely at the definition. This means whenever something, two things are related by R1, they are also related by R2, which means that R2 may contain more relations than R1 because it contains every uh, pair that R1 contains. In addition, it, it, it may contain more pairs. So both things are related by R2. So if you want to picture it in terms of uh, equivalence classes, If this is what uh, R1 looks like, right? Maybe I can draw in different colors. So this is R1. I think I can choose a different color from here. Don't know exactly how to. There's a way to do that. Uh, uh, forget it. I'll just draw. So R2 is a refinement actually means that. R2. Will have more. Equivalence classes. Right? Why is that? Because remember, I mean, when two points, when two elements are in equivalence class, that means they are related. That's the same thing as saying that they are related, right? So the definition says if they are related by R1, so sorry, I have mixed up the two. Right. So this is uh, R2 and this is R1. So whenever two things are related by R1, right? Say so the, these two X and Y, these two are related by R1 because they are in the same equivalence, of course, the uh, the bold lines are also dotted, so you have to understand that uh, the dots are just not visible because they have been overridden by the bold. So these two points are in the same equivalence class according to R1, and they are also in the same equivalence class according to R2. But R2 contains more relations because. Uh, These two points are not related according to R1 by R1, but they are related by R2, right? So this is what we mean by refinement. We add more equivalence classes inside the equivalence classes, okay? And this pic picture makes it clear why it is a refinement. Because in R2, we have a, course uh, partition. Okay, so these are known as partitions, the equivalence classes. I mean, they're all disjoint and their union is the entire set, right? So for R2, you, we have a course partitioning, but for R1, we have an if, we have a more refined uh, partition. So is this definition clear? OK, so please keep in mind these two important uh, notions, that of index and that of refinement. OK. Now let us come back 
to uh, a discussion on languages and regular languages. OK, we define. Two equivalence relations. on sigma star, okay, as follows. One, so given an arbitrary language, over sigma and by that we mean that l need not be regular we define an associated uh, Equivalence relation on Sigma star by X, the string X is related to Y if and only if, so I'm using this by implication here. Uh, sorry, let me just write if and only if here because I'll re need that other symbol to do something else. If and only if uh, for each Z, either both of but neither of XZ and YZ lie in L, which means for all Z in Sigma star, of course, the following is true. X, Z belongs to L if and only if Y, Z belongs to L. Okay. So either both XZ and YZ belong to L or neither belong to L. That's the meaning of this of this thing here. Okay. Is the definition clear? And what we are going to show we will show that L is a regular set. If and only if the index of RL is finite. Well, first of all, we should check that uh, this relation XRLY is indeed an equivalence relation, but that is rather easy to check. Why is that? To show that it is reflexive, just take uh, Z to be epsilon, okay? So X belongs to L if and only if Sorry, uh, that did. 
Uh, I mean, you 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 have to show that x x r l x, right? And uh, to show that, uh, just take uh, any string z. I mean, x z belongs to l if and if and only if x z belongs to l. So that is certainly true for any string z, right? So it is reflexive and showing that uh, it is symmetric and transitive is also easy, okay? Uh, so there's not much to verify there. So it, it, is, an, uh, it is an equivalence relation. Uh, and this result says that L is regular if and only if the index of RL is finite. So there are this equivalence relation. If uh, the number of equivalence classes is finite, then the language is regular and vice versa. Okay. So this is, a, this is if and only if, remember. Okay. So it is a necessary and sufficient condition. So that's the first equivalence relation. So this is RL, right? Number two is given a DFA M, any DFA Q of the alphabet sigma delta Q zero F. We define an equivalence relation which we call RM. So this is again a binary relation on sigma sigma star. Defined by X R M Y if and only if both X and Y take the automaton uh, from the initial state to the same state. Okay. So the resulting state is the same. Sorry, this should be Y. Whether you take X as input or Y as input. And of course, this is delta hat here. That's understood because X and Y are strings rather than single letters. Right? So why is this an equivalence relation? Well, if X and Y are the same string, obviously they'll take the automaton to the same state. And because equality itself is, is, a, is an equivalence relation, I mean, uh, symmetry and transitivity just follow from there, okay? So nothing much to check, right? So these are two relations that we'll need in the statement of uh, my hill narrow theorem. Note that the first relation RL is based on some arbitrary language, need not be regular. Uh, the second relation is based on a, a given DFA, right? But both the relations are on the same set. 
these are both binary relations on the set of all strings on sigma. Okay, so they they relate two strings. So any doubts about these two relations? Okay, so here are a few uh, facts to note. Number one, there's a one to one correspondence or a bijection between the reachable states of N of the DFA M. And the equivalence classes of R M. Right? Why is that? Well, yes, the DFA. Right, think of any state. So this is the initial state uh, Q0. Think of any state Q, right? Now, any reachable state Q. Now, all the strings that take the automaton M from Q0 to Q, right? They're all related by RM. That's what the definition of RM says. Right? So, uh, what is the number of equivalence classes? Well, every state which is reachable from the initial state, including the initial state itself, uh, forms an equivalence class. Okay? And two distinct states form two, uh, two distinct reachable states from two distinct equivalence classes. Any doubts about that? Because if you take another state, Q naught, uh, Q dash, the strings that'll take you from Q naught to Q dash, they're all distinct from the strings that will take you from Q naught to Q. Why? Because we are talking about a DFA, not an NFA. For a DFA, given any string, uh, you can reach only a unique state starting from the initial state. So each reachable state corresponds to an equivalence class. Any doubts? Any doubts about that? And what is the language accepted by M? Equivalence class of the final states. Union of those. Right. 
Right. So these are uh, the equivalents, the union of the equivalence classes of X, where delta Q0 X belongs to X, right? Okay, that's the first fact. Uh, the second one, is this, this important property. Uh, this property says, if X are M Y, then X Z are M, Y, Z for all Z belonging to Sigma star uh, because we use this result earlier and this can be proved by induction. Uh, delta, this is of course delta hat, delta Q zero X Z is delta delta q zero x comma z these are all delta hats and because we know that this is the same as delta uh, q zero y by definition because x r m y comma z so these two are equal because X R M Y. And this is the same as Delta Q zero Y Z. Right? So this is this property is called right invariant. So we need to define it because this is a property that we'll use in the statement of the theorem. An equivalence relation R on sigma star. Uh, satisfying Uh, X R Y implies X X Z R Y Z for all Z Um, is said to be right invariant. In other words, if two things are two strings are related, then um, concatenating any string on the right will result in, uh, again, two related strings. That's the meaning of uh, right invariants. Right? So uh, this point two, item two above says, R M 
is right invariant. Right. Well, about RL, well, we shall see later. In general, RL need not be right invariant for an arbitrary language. But for regular languages, it is indeed right invariant. And let me stop there. We'll have a quiz next Monday. I'll send you the details by email. And that's the end of today's class.